Uh, I want to remind you we have workshops this afternoon at 5 o'clock. It's going to cover photosynthesis. Um, I'll see how far we get today, but I think probably what I'm going to do is end the materials for the third test after Mendelian genetics and before we get to molecular genetics. It's sort of stupid to split it in the middle and whatnot. So we'll, we'll see how it goes with that. We had finished last time looking at the classical monohybrid cross. I want to review a little bit, showing you the analogy between meiosis uh, and Mendel's hypothesis of there being two factors in a parental organism, a diploid, which then segregate to form gametes and the gametes recombine. So if you look at this, this is a genetically pure homozygous dominant individual. Okay? True breeding trait. That means when it crossed to itself, it's going to give itself again and again. On the other side, we have the opposite of real form, the recessive, wrinkled seed, if that's what you want to look at. Again, diploid. In the meiotic process, each of those homologs, okay, are going to make chromatids. We're going to separate the homologs from meiosis one, you'll separate the chromatids from meiosis two, and you're going to produce four gametes. So you're going to make all the gametes alike for the homozygous dominant and for the heterozygous recessive. I'm only going to show one because all of them are exactly the same. One of the things you need to keep in mind when you look at genetic crosses is that we're looking at the probability of what might be produced. So there's four possible gametes, only one of which will actually be used. We're going to combine those together to make the heterozygote, which is a diploid organism. But it shows the dominant phenotype because it masks the recession. As long as there is one dominant allele present, you'll get the dominant phenotype, whatever it happens to be. Now, when these form gametes, they're going to make two different kinds. There's four gametes, two big R's, two little R's, each on the chromosome. And, and the reason I want to show you this is because sometimes you might get confused uh, of exactly how we're segregating the gametes and then recombining them, et cetera. But if you draw the lines to represent the chromosomes and follow the meiotic process, then you just need to put the labels on the chromosomes, et cetera, and it becomes pretty easy to see how they're segregated. We can recombine these, all possible combinations of what you want to show, and a device called the Punnett square, which is simply a box, okay? When you're looking at a single cross, a monohybrid cross, you're going to have a box of four. If you have a dihybrid cross, you're going to have a box of 16. We'll look at that in just a minute when we do the dihybrid crosses. Again, a specific example using flower color, pure breeding, pure breeding, okay? Homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive. This is the heterozygote, okay? Half the five, half the gametes will be the dominant allele, half will be the recessive. You recombine those, and you end up with a typical classical ratio for a monohybrid cross of three to one when you recombine them. Now this is sort of where we finished last time. We can look at the ratios, okay? The, the, the ratios will never be an exact 75-25 to 3-1. It will be an approximation. It's a statistical sample, et cetera. And so as long as you're close enough to the numbers to represent 3-1, you'll have a classic monohybrid cross. 3 to 1 means it's a monohybrid cross. And we'll come back and see why that's significant in just a second. These are the results that Mendel got. And in each of these cases, it turned out to be a ratio uh, of 3 to 1. Now, when you look at the process, what you see is that there's two different ways you can express the ratio. One of which is what they actually look like. Three of them are round, one of them is wrinkled. However, the genotypic ratio, what the allele combinations look like, are different. Two are homozygous, one is homozygous dominant, one is homozygous recessive, and two are heterozygous, having a combination of each of the dominant and the recessive alleles. Now, the, the beauty of Mendel's hypothesis, remember, this is a, a suggestion that he's making, a scientific hypothesis, that their traits are distinct, okay, each individual has two traits, and the traits segregate when the gametes form and then they recombine. So what he's basically proposing is that if you look at a typical parental cross, true breeding to true breeding, the F1 is a heterozygous. 
And the beauty of that hypothesis is that it's scientifically testable. The way you can test it is by doing what's called a back cross or a test cross. More appropriately, it's called test cross. However, it's very common in horticultural conditions to cross back to one of the parents. And in this particular case, you're going to back cross with a recessive parent. The recessive parent will have two alleles, okay, both being the recessive allele, etc. So it doesn't really matter, okay. All the gametes will be the same. So in essence, it's kind of hidden. Now what you're going to do is you're going to cross that individual to what you presume to be the unknown phenotype, genotype uh, of the F1. If it is homozygous dominant, then all the progeny should be round. If it's a heterozygote, then you get a ratio of 50-50. And when men move into the experiments, he always got a 50-50 ratio, one to one which is what led him to believe that there are two characters and the characters segregate during the process of gamete formation. It, it, it's really a, a, a startling concept, particularly for the time that Mendel did this kind of work. So, um, the, the results were given in a couple of meetings in 1865. This is the time of the American Civil War. Uh, in Europe, the natural history societies, which were basically the scientific meetings of those individual days, would hold sort of conferences and said people would get together and they'd express their ideas. Mendel did that. He did it twice, okay? Once on February 8th, and then again a month later on March 8th, etc. And for the most part, his work was totally ignored. Nobody really paid much attention to it. Most people weren't interested in plant horticultural crossings, et cetera, and whatnot. And it wasn't until 1900 that people began to recognize the significance of what he had done. However, today we don't really credit Mendel so much for describing a monohybrid cross, and that you have two characters segregated. What we give him credit for is changing the way the scientific method was done in the mid 1800s. First thing he did is he did numerical analyses of the results of his experiment. Mostly it was qualitative at that particular time. In essence, he also used statistical analysis. He used extremely large sample sizes. Nobody did that. Nobody made sample sizes of that character or that size. What they would normally do is cross a big horse and a little horse, like I said the other day, and make a medium sized horse, and that's the end of it. They never went on subsequent in terms of the breeding pattern. And he followed his results for several generations. That's the foundational basis of inquiry based research, which is what I told you in the beginning of the course is the, the, the methodology used by biology today is an inquiry based approach. And that's what he should be given credit for, for that kind of approach more than anything else. He also then gets a lot of credit showing that blended inheritance was not a primary method of passing traits from generation to generation. They maintain their discrete integrity over time, etc., and they don't become blended. What's the cause of brown, and what's the cause of wrinkle? Ultimately, we're going to get back down to the gene level, and the gene level is going to produce proteins, and those proteins are then going to give us a particular phenotype of disorder. So what this table shows us is the three genetic ratios, the homozygous dominant, the homozygous recessive, and the heterozygous. And what we're going to look at is phenotype, round, round, wrinkle, and then we're going to look at starch. Turns out, starch is a very hygroscopic molecule. It doesn't dissolve itself readily in the water. And if you look at the round phenotype, it has an extremely large amount of starch. If you look at the starch grains, there's numerous starch grains. If you click on that link, it'll show you a picture of starch grains. If you look at the recessive condition, there's very few starch grains. The antithesis of starch is the glucose units that are broken down from starch. You break down the starch, you make individual glucose units, etc., and so you have what's called a high reducing sugar content. So in the 20s and 30s, people began looking at what is the cause of the presence of the starch. And they found the starch branching enzyme. The starch branching enzyme is what takes primary starch or amylose. 
and then branches it off to make it a little more soluble, et cetera, and gives you lots of interfaces where water can interact with the, the starch molecules and become a little bit solubilized in the process. What they found was that the starch branching enzyme in the wrinkle seed <coughs> is protected. It's mutated and it no longer would produce branches onto the starch. Now, it, it, it's sort of a, a, a funny way of looking at this because starch is non hygroscopic, okay, which means it doesn't absorb water. However, when you bring the seed in from the field and you bring it in to the barn and you dry the seed, okay, it, it kind of wrinkles up, okay, because the water is gone. There's no water for it to do. You know, it's, it's funny. I tell every class this thing. It's just a funny analogy. It's, a, um, it's sort of a, a, a look at the American consumer. Um, you go to the grocery store and you buy some frozen tea. Right? If you look at the packages of the frozen tea, okay, bird's eye, for example, you don't really see the peas. Okay? The plastic frozen container okay, is okay. You can't see the inside. And the reason is, is because the peas, for the most part, would be wrinkled. Okay? What's the difference between a round pea and a wrinkled pea? Round pea has a lot of starch in it. You ever had pea soup? It's kind of like red paper paste. Okay? It's really thick and yucky. But it comes from nice big rat found round peas. Where's the sugar come from? The wrinkle seed, okay, which doesn't have the starch, it's broken all the starch down to sugar, should be very sweet. But the American consumer won't buy wrinkle seed because they don't look good. It's wrinkled. So Birdseye spends a lot of money trying to make a round seed that has a high sugar content but doesn't look wrinkled. It's not really easy to do that. This is, this is what the seeds look like. These are the wrinkled seeds, okay, and these are the nice round seeds. Now, it, it took some time, but they finally figured out what the cause of it was. There are a group of genetic elements, and when we get to molecular genetics, we'll talk a little bit more about all the genetic elements that make up the, the genome of an organism. There's this group of elements called transposons. They're also called jumping genes. They're segments of DNA that can move from a DNA area to another DNA area, from chromosome to chromosome to chromosome. And what caused the mutation of the starch branch of gene was a transposon that inserted itself into the normal starch branch of gene, which then changed the reading frame, et cetera, produced a mutant protein that wouldn't branch, et cetera, and you ended up with the wrinkled genes. Uh, one of the other things that Hendel looked at was stem length. It turns out that that character is due to the presence of a particular hormone called gibberellic acid. Gibberellic acid is produced by an enzyme called GA3B hydroxylase, which converts a precursor into that hormone. And that hormone stimulates cell elongation and growth and makes whole plants, etc. And the mutational event then turns out to be the next gene coding for that individual enzyme which then ends up getting you dwarf plants. And mo most of the characters that we're going to look at that are recessive are due to a mutation in the protein being produced by a defective gene in one way or another. Now, one of the perplexing things about the Mendelian hypothesis, particle segregation, and the idea that they are discrete entities unto themselves is what we call incomplete dominance. This is an example of incomplete dominance in stamp writing. If you cross a red flower with a white flower, you get a pink flower. Does that not look like blending in our We have to be able to explain that in Mendelian terms based on what he has proposed. And the way we're going to do that is by what we'll call codominance. In this particular case, we have two genes, the C gene and the CW gene and the CR gene, red and white. Each of them is a dominant allele. There is no recessive allele. But the coloration in the flowers is due to more than one pigment. Okay. 
and each of these pigments is dominant, etc. So it expresses that particular color. One expresses an anthocyanin pigment that gives you sort of a whitish color, the other a red color, etc. And when you mix those, okay, each of these pigments is produced and it sort of looks like a blended tray. But the inherited pattern follows Mendelian regulations, etc. You're going to get the gametes, okay? One allele on this one, one allele on this one. You combine these together, and then when you put it through, you're going to end up with what looks like one, two, one. One dominant, one dominant, and a couple of heterozygotes in which you've combined the dominant alleles together. So we can explain what we think to be blended inheritance by looking at co dominance of each of these characters interacting with each other. It's a multiple allele process or a multiple gene process. And a lot of physical traits, one of the fortunate things that Mendel did is he picked single trait genes that are responsible for only one phenotypic character. But there are a lot of characters in the genotypes of lots of individual organisms that require more than one gene. But it is explainable in terms of this inheritance pattern that he looked at. Now what we're going to do next is what's called a dihybrid crop, which is going to be two traits. I'm going to pick some examples for us. Instead. We're going to look at flower color and seed color. Now, if I give you genetic problems on the test, I probably have to tell you what the characters are and whether they're dominant or recessive. I'm going to have to say that. So I'll do that here. Okay? We have a red flower that is dominant to the recessive white flower. And we have seed color in which green is dominant to the yellow color in the seed. I, I give you that. Now, if we're doing crosses, one of the ways we sort of shorthand it is by using the alphabetic taxonomy with the capital letters being dominant and the lowercase letters being recessive. And we need to pick letters. We can pick A, B, C, D, E, etc. There are some rules. Okay. The American Genetical Society suggests that you use the letter that designates the recessive trait that you're looking at. So in this particular case, I should use the letters W and ooh, I didn't do that. I didn't use a Y. I used the G. I don't care what letters you use. As long as you define for yourself what those letters mean. If I'm defining it for you on a test, if I'm telling you we're going to use the letter G, and the dominant is green, the lowercase letter then is yellow, that's what it is. Just keep in track in your mind what you're doing in terms of doing these crosses. So the classical Mendelian cross, we start with true breeding parents. So I'm going to cross a, a red flower, green seeded, okay, to a white flower, yellow seeded. True breeding in each case, I breed them to themselves, I get themselves. And I'm going to produce a completely heterozygous F1. And as we did with the monohybrid cross, we're then going to cross that to itself. So we want to look and see what the results of this dihybrid cross will be. And here's what the results are. I'm going to list each of the characters separate and independent, flower color and seed color. Here we have flower color. We have some reds and we have some whites. And here we have the seed color, greens and yellow, etc. And they do occur in very specific ratios. The ratio out of 16 progeny produced, negative multiple, 10 times 16, 160 of them. Okay. Nine out of the 16 will be red and green, like one of the parents, one out of 16 will be white and yellow, like the other parent. Okay? But you also see that there are now two combinations of the progeny that don't look like either parent. There are some that are white and green and red and yellow. And they occur in specific ratios of 3 out of 16, 3 out of 16. So if, if I give you a problem in which you're looking at the number of progeny produced, et cetera, and you count them and you come up with 9, 3, 3, 1, you know you're looking at a dihybrid cross. Okay, very simple. Now, Let's look at the red flower alone. Okay, I have nine and three. Okay, that's twelve. And let me look at the alternate allele, the white flower. I have three to one, four. That's a three to one ratio. So each of these traits, independent of the other trait, 
gives you a classical monohybrid inherited pattern. But when you combine them, okay, what does that tell you? What it tells Mendel is that these traits sort independent of each other. This is a complex figure. Let me figure this out. See what it says. Here we have, okay, the, the red flower, and, and we have the F1. On this particular homologue, we have a dominant and a recessive allele separated from each other on those two chromatids of that homologue. The other one is the flower color. Now, when you make the gametes, and the gametes are going to gonna recombine, what are you going to do? Well, the big R is going to combine with the big Y, the big R is going to combine with the little Y, the little R is going to combine with the big Y, and the little R is going to combine with the little Y, and you're going to end up with four different gamete types that go through a region. Okay? What's going to be on this side if they are dependent? That is, if the alleles occur on the same chromosome, not different chromosomes, then they can't sort independently. So, the, the, these are going to go together. The big R and the big Y is going to combine with the little R and the little Y. And you end up with two gametes. So if, if you think about this, it's a very clever way of determining whether two traits occur on different chromosomes or on the same chromosome by looking at the gamete types that are produced by that. Now, in terms of sorting independent, okay, it means that each of these homologous chromosomes sorts independent of the other. What we said before, they can line up differently. So over here, we're going to end up with these four gamete types on this side, and these four gamete types on this side, the same thing, and now we're going to combine them. And we end up with nine that look like that. We end up with three that look like that. We end up with three that look like that. We end up with one that looks like that. Which tells you that these traits sort independent of each other, and therefore they're on different components. Which is what Mendel calls the law of independence work. So he has two laws, or two hypotheses. The law of segregation, in which the, the traits will segregate from each other when gametes are formed, and the law of independent assortment. The traits are carried on different chromosomes, and the chromosomes sort independent of each other. Remember, Mendel knew nothing about chromosomes. Chromosomes weren't discovered until the early 1900s. He had no concept of that at all. Now, this is a dihybrid cross. The other pictures we just looked at, the way in which you combine that. It's kind of complex. Okay. You're not going to be held responsible for doing a dihybrid cross. I'm not going to do that. We'll do that in the genetics class. We'll go through lots of those kinds of things, etc. But I wanted you to know what a dihybrid cross looks like. Now, maybe it's easier. If we do a lot, maybe you'll see it a little bit easier. Here we're going to use the letters A and B. Okay. It's easy. And then we segregate them out. And they simply follow a specific kind of pattern if you think about it. How many of them have at least one dominant A and one dominant B? Or one dominant allele for one trait and one dominant allele for the other trait? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. Nine, three, three, one, right? How many are uh, homozygous for one allele and heterozygous for the other allele? Okay. This is homozygous for this allele and heterozygous for the other allele. Okay? We got one here. We got one here. We got one here. We got another one here. It doesn't matter whether it's dominant or recessive, it's just the homozygous, the same. I, I, I think you understand it. That's not very difficult to do at all. You know where the problem comes? When I tell you that this is round and yellow or wrinkled and green, then it gets confusing. Then you have to keep track of what the letters actually mean in the process. And I don't want to hold you responsible for that at dihydro cross level. But I will hold you responsible for it at the monohybrid cross level. So let's do some genetics problems. Okay? Squat. The gene W represents white color, is dominant over the real, the yellow color. 
I've given you the information in the question. Now the question. The expected F1 phenotypes from a cross between homozygous white, two big W's, and homozygous yellow, two little W's, would be what? Can you do it? If you can't do it, you're in trouble. Really simple. Homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, the F1. That's what Mendel proposed to the F1. Do you remember this character? The alien life form out. It was a TV show probably when you were younger. Probably when you were about 10, maybe even younger than that. Six or seven. You know, it's a lot of fun to do this. Okay. Out with brown fur dominant to white fur. A brown fur out named Charlie is crossed with a white fur out. And the progeny occur in a ratio of 50 to 50. What's Charlie's genotype? Did you do it? <laughs> there you go. Charlie's genotype. He's a heterozygous. Let's do another one. Can you roll your tongue? I can roll my tongue. Hopefully it's dominant. They have four children. These are good questions for you to practice with. Be sure you can do those because you'll see some of those that look like that uh, on the third exam. Now, the monastery had fire. And the large majority of Mendel's work was lost. All his data tables and everything else was lost. So all that was left was the original talks that he gave and what he had published uh, in, in 1886. Um, and so for a long period of time, it was sort of ignored. We get to the 1900s, and people were beginning to look at the structure of cells, the concept of mitosis and meiosis, et cetera. And the idea of what Mendel had observed begins to reemerge because it blends pretty well with what we know about the processes of meiosis. Uh, Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary were looking at the processes of forming sperm and egg cells in, in some insects and in some sea urchins and the like, etc. And, and they made a couple of starting correlations between what Mendel had reported. First off, they discovered chromosomes. They recognized there was a body during the divisional process that begins to condense and you could see them during the divisional process, etc and that they're carried in sperm and eggs, okay? The hereditary traits follow Mendel's law. They occur in pairs, okay? And they segregate during the meiotic process, and they sort independently. So we're beginning to get into an era in which we're looking at what's called the chromosomal theory of inheritance, mm -hmm. which in essence basically says, Mendel's traits are carried on chromosomes, and chromosomes follow the laws of meiosis. So if you could follow meiosis, you should be able to segregate and recombine the alleles in any one combination that you want to do. Which brings us to what's called by some the golden age of chromosomal genetics. The period between 1900 and about 1924, 25, somewhere in that neighborhood. Most of the prominent work done in that era was done at Columbia University in uptown New York uh, in the laboratory of Thomas Hunt Worthy, um, who was looking at Okay. The, the structure of the genomic makeup of organisms, chromosomes and the like, and he used the model organism of the fruit fly. What you see here is the, the wild type of the normal eye color in fruit flies, which is a reddish, pinkish, white color, etc. And here you see a mutant that lacks the pigment to produce that red color in, in the fly eye. There's a, an anecdotal story. Um, you know what a college work study student is. Well, in, in the 20s, there wasn't a college work study student, but there were student volunteers in, in research laboratories. And one of them was named Calvin Bristol. Now, his role as an undergraduate <coughs> was primarily to do the dishwashing. And the way in which they reared the flies was they took an old-fashioned cream jar. I don't suspect you remember what cream jars looked like, but when milk was delivered by the milkman to the house, 
put in a little box on the front porch instead of there was a, a glass container of milk, and then there was a, sh a little short bottle, real thick little glass bottle of cream. They used those cream bottles. What they would do in the bottom is put some cornmeal, and then they put some flies and inoculate the flies into that, and they put a cotton stopper in the top, wrapped in cheesecloth, etc., so that the flies could rear themselves. Et cetera. And it doesn't take too long, so a week or two, and, and you can have the, lots of reproduction, produce lots of flies. And what Calvin's job was is that after they had used these jars to rear the flies and then did the animal plus, he has to wash the jars. And so he takes them into the lab and he washes them out. And one day when he's washing them, he observes the white eyed fly. Nobody had seen it before, but he did. And he showed it to Thomas Hunt Morgan. And Thomas Hunt Morgan recognized that this is a phenotypic difference. This may be related to the genetics. It turns out to be the recessive allele. Okay, for the white eyed flies. And this is where they begin their crosses, etc., to find how things have moved from generation to generation to So So, what Thomas Hunt Morgan gets credit for is discovering the chromosome. And he divides them up into two categories the sex chromosomes, which are responsible for controlling sex in, in organisms and what are called the autosomes, all the other chromosomes of that particular species, however many chromosomes we have. One of the ways we look at the analogy of chromosomes today in terms of their structure is by a device called a karyotype. A karyotype is a photographic representation of the chromosomes taken during something around metaphase, a little bit before metaphase, at metaphase, a little bit after metaphase, as they start to move in anaphase, then you take a, <coughs> excuse me, a photographic picture of the condensed chromosomes, etc. And you, in those days, you cut it out with a pair of scissors. Today, you can use Photoshop and you can outline it quite nicely, etc. Yeah. <coughs> and then you begin to line up the chromosomes based on their size and their morphology. Homologous pairs, chromosome pair number one in the human species, chromosome pair number 22, 1 to 22 are the autosomes responsible for all the genetic characters of our species. So the other pair, the X and the Y chromosome, will define sex in this individual. In this particular case, we have two that are the same size, etc. There is no other chromatin or the other animal of the other chromosome, etc. So this is a female. Now what you see is dark and light bands. What are the bands? There are stains that you can stain the DNA with during the mitotic process or the meiotic process, whichever one you have in the end, to produce the carrier. Okay. In, in which the stain specifically binds to regions of high AT content. Here you see, this is a region that has an extremely amount of high AT, which is a sort of a gene four region. It's not active genes in the area. Kind of like a little bit like heterochromosome inactive gene area extension. But the pattern is unique. You can identify each individual chromosome by what its branding pattern looks like. Kind of like a fingerprint. Okay. This is a male. What you see here is the sex chromosomes are different sizes, different morphologies. Um, the sex chromosomes described as sex chromosomes by Matthew Stevens in 1905, um, observing mealworms and beginning to follow the, the, the idea of chromosomal inheritance in the early 1900s, etc. She looked at mealworms and she found a pair of chromosomes that were different sizes. Wait, what do you mean? Male, I but the same chromosomes turned out to be the same size. So you didn't want to come in. So we now are going to look at. A oh, monohybrid cross uh, involving sex determination. I was joking. Not your dad. Did you come to the mm. That's my grandfather. Okay. He's 13 now. I guess he was probably 8. Okay, then me too. No, he is a heterogametic sex. What's a heterogametic sex? The sex chromosomes are different sizes and different morphologies. The female of the species, that's my granddaughter. Okay. Homogametic sex. The, the chromosomes that determine sex are of the same like. size and morphology, etc. They each produce the appropriate gametes, the gametes recombine, and you get males, these are females, etc. So 
It's your fault, guys, if you have only groceries. Okay? You, you, you know, the spouses have nothing to do with this. They simply provide two X's or the X. You're going to provide either the X or the Y. If you have daughters, it, it's your responsibility. Now, there are other ways of determining sex. The person has played a lot of games with how we're going to combine all of this kind of material. Here we have one called the XO system, which there is only one size chromosome. When sex is determined, okay, the female has two of the same size chromosome, but the male only has one. In the ZY system, it is exactly reversed. It's a number of avian species, including chickens, in which the heterogamating sex is female, not male. And the homogamating sex is male, not female. So it's sort of a reverse circumstance. And a number of things like bees, a number of insect species, you end up with diploid haploid conditions that are responsible for sex determination. Now, one of the consequences of having different morphology in the chromosome, which is, let me show you the, the different morphology. Do you have the feeling like when you're in the middle of something, you just zone out? If you feel like what you're doing? This is the difference in morphology in the chromosome. Yeah. There's something on the order of 2,000 genes on the X chromosome. A lot of human genetic diseases can be carried on the X chromosome. The shame, muscular dystrophy, and some other things. Red green color blindness is one of them that's carried on the on the X chromosome instead of one. There is no corresponding region what you do. on the Y chromosome. <laughs> Evolutionarily, we believe that the two chromosomes that determine sex started out with the same morphology. Yeah. Over time, the Y yeah, chromosome has become significantly yeah. reduced during yeah. the replication yeah. process of these individual yeah. chromosomes. There's only about 80 genes per se on the Y chromosome. Not significantly responsible for lots of material, except for one set of genes, the SRY gene, which triggers a series of transcription factors that trigger a number of other genes, et cetera, on the autosome that will eventually lead to the maleness habit in those individuals, et cetera. Um, there, there are some evolutionary <coughs> geneticists who believe that eventually we will eliminate the life of the world together in our species. I like this as well. That remains to be seen. Do you have Klein with what he's doing? Let's now look yeah, at the inheritance good. pattern. Yeah, I thought I heard he was good. We have yeah, he did. Okay. an antithesis of trait, male and female, bound in wrinkles. Is it inherited in exactly the same that. pattern yeah, in the monohybrid trait? It does. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, let's look at the cross. Oh, yeah. Two X's, an X and a Y. And yet, turns out that you end up with a ratio of 50 50, not 3 to 1. It's a different yeah. ratio. Even though theoretically you're looking at two phenotypes. And I got now, it turns out that there's actually 106 yeah, yeah, males. Yeah, um, you see, however, it seems like, that genetically, it's, it's more males like setting up your than females, so the ratio ends up approximately one to one. Can you use it, but can you just leave the tab open? Statistical yeah, probability more than anything else. Now, one of the things that's unique about the sex inheritance pattern is if a trace <laughs> carry on the X oh, you just chromosome. Said that just, yeah. And the male only has one dose of that chromosome. That's just like the, the difficult things you guys So I, I don't have a heterozygous <laughs> condition. <laughs> and then there's like I'm going to use a new term. Today. I have a hemizygous <laughs> condition. Okay. Instead of heterozygous where you have one of each, I have a hemizygous <laughs> half. <laughs> so it only takes one allele to be present on the X chromosome <laughs> to be seen. Or here's a problem. Yeah. I have an individual, a female, <laughs> who is a carrier for red green color. It, it, it's the genes that produce the pigment that's responsible for your color vision. Too far. She's dominant on one chromosome, recessive yeah. on the other. She has one allele, so we can express the red green color blindness. She's not red green color. Uh, I make the cross. What about the male? Well, a normal male then. One who's not red green colorblind and has the dominant allele. Let's look at the pattern that I get. I end up with okay, two females that are normal. Okay. One's a carrier, one is homozygous dominant. 
and I end up with a ratio of one to one, a normal male to a red-green colorblind male. So the ratios are a little bit out of whack. What's the ratio for the colorblindness alone, irrespective of sex? One dominant, one dominant, one dominant, one recessive. Three to one. So if you're simply looking at the trait carried by the chromosome, it's inherited in the classical monohybrid inherited in the When you end up with some unusual trait, we'll call this individual as that's because of the wife's She's not regular. I think you guys go first. But it makes it easier. No, I think it's, it goes by year. So even though now, we got turned Roman, they can you, actually get in. Okay. Um, so yeah, it goes by seniors, juniors. And in this particular case, I'm going to cross my wife to a colorblind male. Now, in this particular case, the X chromosome carries a recessive allele. Yeah. Right here. So in this particular case, I end up with a normal female and one female who's red green colorblind. So in order for a daughter to have red green colorblind this condition, the father has to have that particular allele trait of the recessive condition. No other way it can happen. Next, my daughter Kim. We end up again in terms of the males, ratio one to one. Now here's the question on the test, and this is where it gets to, because at this particular point, I'm not sure that you know or are familiar with the terminology of familial history, the great-great-grandfather, the grandfather, the grandmother, etc. So let's try. Tim, maternal grandfather, this guy, is born. So I, I know by, by saying this, Okay. I know what I'm talking about, and I can write the genotype of the maternal grandfather. What is the genotype of Judy's mom? Well, Judy's genotype, okay, is a carrier. So what's this genotype right here? Who's got the answer? Uh, F3R, F4R. X, big R? Yeah. X, little r. What's wrong with little r, little r? Little r, little r, long Ah, you see the trick? There's two possible answers to this question. Okay, this, this genotype right here, this could be a little r, because it's not asking what that person is. If this is a colorblind female, you can still get the head of the cycle. So be careful when you do these. It's not easy to do these things in your college. Okay. You know the other place you're going to make a mistake? I actually tried to, to like understand. I'm going to tell you to cross Charlie, who can roll his tongue, with Judy, who can't roll her tongue. Okay? And you know what you're going to do? I'm going to tell you in the question that the trait for tongue rolling is on chromosome 12. But you know what you're going to do when you draw the punnett square? You're going to put it on axis. Okay. Just because it's male and female crossed together doesn't mean it's sex linked. I have to tell you, this trait is sex linked. Then you put it on X and Y. If it doesn't say it's sex linked, don't put the X's and Y. Okay? It's a real simple thing, but you, you, you always, for some reason, a lot of you always think you have to have the X's and Y's just because it's male and female. In the now, I shouldn't do this. Yeah, I sometimes get myself, I have, I've had some criticism about what I'm about to do. Because it, it can be startling to some people who don't know, etc. Turns out red green colorblindness blindness occurs in the male population at about 8% in the United States. And females, about 1%. Because you have to have a colorblind male crossing the uh, at least a carrier of females. Anybody here know their colorblind? Any colorblind individuals in the room? Anybody never, ever been tested for colorblindness? Okay, close your eyes. <laughs> it's the Ishihira test. What do you see? Those of you who raised your hand, do you see a 12? Anybody not see it well? 
Okay. Then you're done yeah, with this map. Oh, the answer is about the question. Yeah, right here. Right here. I'm going to let you do that on your own. You know you can do those kind of problems. And you know what you're doing in your class. Do you take any of these yet? Now, I'll take this. I'm taking this one. We said that one of Mendel's hypotheses was independent source. Traits are different from the source. Oh, that's not the same. What's the result of the problem? Why is it together? Well, obviously, they don't work in the Unless you break the chromosomes, they're going to go together. I don't know. I don't know. First of all, what we're going to predict is that they're not going to store the intestines. She has to take one class. Oh, you need super serious. That's going to be a very important thing. Yeah, my super serious. What is real? No, I'm going to take the... I can use that particular phenomenon. Just have the same one. During the crossing over of the chromosomes, to actually map. It's stressful. Like, <laughs> let me show you how we do so many years. <laughs> we start with a parental generation, almost like a dominant, almost like a successive. We end up with a heterozygote, right? so and many. then we cross that heterozygote what with an almost like a successive using a test. <laughs> <laughs> now, the beauty of this is that no matter what <laughs> you do with the recession, like you okay, always end up with the same allele. Okay, it doesn't matter whether there are different chromosomes or whether there are the same phone. chromosomes. It's yeah. all recessive <laughs> all the time. But well, what about the other? <laughs> Over here, in which I have linked genes, okay, the R on one, the Y on another, etc. When they begin to segregate, you're going to end up with four different kinds of alleles. I'm sorry. This is backwards. This should be linked to C9. I need to change that. I just realized that that's, that's, that's labeled wrong. Does everybody agree that that's labeled wrong? Yes. Yeah. Because these are on the same, so that's have to be linked. These are on different, so they have to be on the same. So when this forms gametes, how many gametes do you have? Yeah. What is it? Four. If they're linked, how many gametes do you have? Okay. I don't know, so how do you know where the genes are linked? You do a cross like that. Homozygous dominant to homozygous consent. You have one, you make a test cross, you get a one to one ratio. Either I tell you, how that or you simply count the number of progeny types that you get in this process. Now, no matter what, when I cross this to this, over here, this is going to be the recessive condition, this is going to be the dominant condition. Here you're going to get different combinations of no, those but it's a, okay. So the answer is really simple. We know whether genes are linked or not. So actually, no, it's you do a classical cross, two breed, F1 test cross, and you end up with a progeny ratio of one to one. That's what it tells you. So we go into the lab and we do this. We play Mendel, we do the genes, etc. We put them all together. We know that they're linked, etc. And we make it, and I predict that the progeny that are going to produce are going to be 50 of one kind and 50 of another kind. 50, 50, one to one. However, when I look at the progeny, what do I see? I see some that are like the parent, some are round and yellow. 45% are like one parent, the other. Remember, the parent was a heterozygote. Thanks, bro. And we crossed it to a homozygous receptor. Those are the parents. 
But that's not all the problem. You get a whole bunch that are not no, like either parent. Teacher. But the teacher away. How can that happen? And the only way that can happen is if you exchange the genetic material between those particular ones. And that's what Morgan realized. You could cross over exchange the genetic material and produce homologous recombination. Here we simply put some letters on these, all the dominants here, all the recessives here. We, we swap them over, et cetera. Now all of a sudden, there's a recessive allele on this chromatid, okay? and there's a dominant allele on this one. The crossing over has exchanged the genetic material. And we assume that it's homologous, that it's exactly the right place so that you don't end up with a reading frame sequence of the nucleotide here that's a little bit different that will give you a mutation in the genetic material. Now, how many progeny did we produce? Well, eight and a half percent of the progeny were like one non-parental, and eight and a half were like the other by recombining these combinations a little bit differently, et cetera. So, answer the question. Okay. Which would be greater in terms of crossing over and exchanging material between non-sister chromatids? A cross between A and B or a cross between A and C? Where's your fingers? What's my knuckle? The knuckle is the kinetic core of the chromosome. I'm going to cross my fingers. What did I cross? I crossed the tips of the fingers. The area right next to the knuckle I can't cross because it's too close. So the farther apart two genes are on a long chromosome, the greater the likelihood that they can exchange and cross over. Okay. The genes next to my shoulder can't cross over. The genes on my wrist can cross over. So you have a, a, a pure physical relationship. The number of non-progeny that can be non-parental progeny that can be produced will depend upon how far apart the genes are. So we're going to look at the percentage of non-parental, the percentage of crossover frequency that occurs for linked genes during the replication in meiosis, um, synapsis, chiasma form, the exchange of genetic material, and we count the number of individuals that are there. Um, and so the farther gene 1 and gene 12 are from each other, the greater, the greater the percentage of crossovers likely to occur. 1 and 2, no. 1 and 12, yes. Now, we just had 17% crossover frequency. 8.5%, 8.5%. .5%. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that 1% crossover frequency, or the percentage of non parental, is equal to one map unit of distance. It's not a physical distance, it's a relative distance. It's not a number of nanometers. No, she's trash. And I'm going to call that 17%. And historically, we've given a lot of credit to Thomas and Morgan for that. But we now refer to a map distance as a center point. So what this really means is the genes R and Y are 17 map units or 17 center organs from each other. That's important. Now let's get complicated. Here's what we get to. We looked at the genes R and Y, and we found that 17% crossover frequency occurred, and therefore I'm going to say that those two genes okay, are 17 map units or 17 centimorgans from each other. Now what I want to do is map those two genes in relative to other genes that occur in this particular chromosome, like a gene X. So what do I do? Well, I start with a cross of the genes R and X. I start with homozygous dominant, cross it to homozygous recessive, I get an F1, and then I do a test score. And I should get a 50-50 ratio, but I get something that's different. I get a number of non parentals that's produced. And when I actually did it, what I found out was that there was 5% crossover frequency. The two non parentals, 2.5%, 2.5%, gave me 5%. What does that tell me? It tells me that the gene X is five map units or five centimorgans from the gene R. But I don't know whether it's on the left or whether it's on the right. So I gotta do it again. What do I do? This time, I take the gene Y and X. 
I go from homozygous dominant cross to homozygous recessive. I produce the F1 and I test cross into the homozygous recessive. And I look at the percentage of non-parentals, and I can get two possible answers. You I can either get some. 12% or 22%. So, so here's the X, five centimeters from this. Okay. And African two okay. as well. And, and African three. 17 African centimeters on Y. Two, two, two. What? Just three okay. centimeters. So I'd end up with that frequency. Two, or two, 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 two. here, uh, I'm looking it's at supposed to be four, but Miami, uh, X and Y being 12. Uh, well, I get 17 here. You can get the idea. Now that's pretty complex. But you know what it tells you? <laughs> it tells you something very, very simple. This is what it tells you. That is organic. It tells you that the traits that are carrier of chromosomes and DNA sets we call genes are linearly arrayed along the length of a chromosome. It could be possible that a portion of the gene for this pigment is only half here and the other half is way over here. That's not true. They're all together. And they occur in linear arrangements along the length of the chromosome. You couldn't get the results more than did. You couldn't map unless these genes were linearly arrayed along the length of the individual chromosome. Here are the gene loci, okay. dominant, recessive. Okay. Here we have a different recessive allele, the dominant allele, you get the idea? They occur at specific points along the length of an individual chromosome at a place we call a gene locus. Nobody knew that in the 20s. So you could do these mapping problems. It's sort of intuitively obvious to you today. You've grown up knowing that. Now I want you to be able to do some math problems. Here's a common math problem that I think I'm going to hold you responsible to be able to do. I'm going to give you the gene and the relative map distances between them. There they are. M is 7 map units from A, P is 19 map units from M, A is 12 map units from P. What's the linear sequence of those two? Put them in order. First one, you yell it out, this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Up at the top? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's wrong with MAP? It works here. Ah. What did you do? You, you really don't know where those genes are on the chromosome. You just know where they are relative to each other. You don't know whether it's north or south of the centromere, okay, whether they're on either side of the centromere, et cetera. But you do know that they are linearly arrayed along the length of that chromosome in the order of PAM or MAP. It just depends on which way you're reading from. So it's important that you recognize that oftentimes, this is the second time this morning I've given you two answers to the question. You have to keep that in mind when you look at the question, what the question is asking, et cetera. And maybe more than one answer. When you do it one way, you get pain. When you do it another way, you get math. You need to keep that in mind. Now, let's play some games. Let's whip around the room for a perspective game. We want to look at some genetic traits, et cetera. We want to do pedigree analysis. We want to be able to read a pedigree and see if we can figure it out, okay? Here's a, a, a cross between a female and a male. The male has an effective trait. Is the trait dominant or recessive? Is the trait sex linked? These are very simple kind of questions that we want to ask in terms of doing this problem. Okay. How can you determine whether this is sex linked or not? Well, right down here, okay, this is what the individual would be. Right? If it was sex linked, carried on the chromosome, he's showing the trait, so it's recessive. Now he's going to be crossed over here. Let's just pick a heterozygote, which means that we would produce a female. Like we did in the previous question, we did it in color. That shows the, the recessive trait. Are there any females from this cross that show the recessive trait? Over there. We'll say that's possible. So now this individual, okay, is, is going to be crossed to a male here. Doesn't show the trait, etc. And it ends up down here. So at all likelihood, this is probably not a sex-linked trait. 
probably a simply recessive inheritance pattern from one side to the other. So being able to do this is an important idea of determining how the inheritance patterns are going to be formed. Look around. Do you have widow peaks? Some of you do, some of you don't. Okay. Dominant trait is a little widow peak, etc. Flat, no widow. You can do the cross. So now, now when you go out on a date next time, you can look at your forehead. See whether or not it's a widow peak. Three-year-olds. Three-year-olds are dumb. I have three-year-olds. Yellows are attached. There's no truth to the fact that if you have one recessive trait, you should have a lot of recessive traits. It doesn't work that way. Can you roll your tongue? Dominant traits. Electric colored ones. We did that. Also carried on the X chromosomes is hemophilia. This is a genealogy chart from um, Edward, the Duke of Kent, and Victoria, all the way down showing the hemophilic inheritance in which the condition that produces the non blood clotting factors for the recessive, et cetera, that leads to the recessive bleeding. And over here on this side, we have the current monarchy in England, et cetera, with Prince Harry and Prince William and all. It, it gives you an idea of how to look at and read the genealogy chart, et cetera. Now, besides those kinds of things, um, there are a lot of Mendelian diseases. And they fall into two categories. One I'll call the inborn errors in metabolism, the other I will call chromosomal abnormality. The inborn errors of metabolism, in essence, are defective enzymes. That produces a mutant protein that then doesn't catalyze a particular biological reaction. It leads to some kind of disease condition in the human being. And here's four examples alketonuria, alcaptonuria, Tay-Sachs disease, and sickle cell. Phenylketonuria is an interesting thing. It's a defective gene that occurs on chromosome 12 that produces a dysfunctional enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxide. <coughs> which normally breaks down the amino acid phenylalanine to the tyrosine, which eventually gets degraded and excreted in the urine of individuals, etc. If you're recessive, you don't produce the enzyme that breaks it down. Phenylalanine begins to accumulate. It will cross the blood-brain barrier, etc., and it will lead to abnormalities, including some mental disorders. <laughs> required by law in all 50 states in the United States at first that every child be tested for phenylketone urea to make sure that they don't have the genetic disorder. It is a treatable genetic disease. It's not curable yet. It may be curable if we get to the point where we can use genetic engineering to replace the defective gene early on in embryonic production. But it's treatable now by taking the child and putting it on a phenylalanine free diet. Turns out that by the time you reach puberty, there are other enzymatic mechanisms to help break down the phenylalanine and the screen. But up until that particular time, you need this hydroxylase enzyme to do that. So if you put them on a restricted phenylalanine diet, this would be fine. If you look at Every soda bottle produced in the United States today is going to say phenylketone urine contains phenylalanine, etc. That's also required by law. So there's a lot of treatable genetic diseases that are not curable. <coughs> Alcaptonuria is another example. In this particular case, the recessive condition described early on in the early 1900s by Girard is a defective enzyme that breaks down the enzyme homogen physic acid. If the enzyme is defective homogen physic acid, it's not broken down, it's not so a funny, treated, etc. It just begins to accumulate. It does have some, some disease side effects, etc. Particularly to leading to damage in cartilage and heart valves to and get practice and experience. Uh, a predominant and kidney stroke like, individuals who are affected. That's not what I teach it for. But the most significant to teach you about turns out to be the oxidation yeah. of homocysteine acid when it's extreme in Europe. 
because upon action with oxygen in the atmosphere, it immediately turns a green color, black, rich color, midnight black. So, because as well as my teacher gave us like a booklet with that in it. The importance of that is that it is the most important thing that we can do. This is the first time early on in the early 1900s when somebody began to suggest that some diseases could be caused by non-functional oh, insulin. It's the first real indication yeah. Yeah. What did you do? that I diseases could be tied to defective proteins, which eventually would be tied to the particular genes you can You have to take one of the yeah, it's, it's a good class. The like, third is case action. Like, the enzyme hexaminase A breaks down ganglioside fats, which begins to accumulate in the nerve tissue. Black in the nerve tissue. And they lead to a condition in which nerve impulses are no longer passed effectively, etc. And it is a non treatable fatal disease in early, early childhood. Uh, the reason I wanted to put this one is yeah, you can, because you can it would demonstrate something called the founder's principle in evolutionary biology. The founder's principle deals with the breeding, either inbreeding or outbreeding of individuals in the individual population. There's a very high prevalence of this condition. In Oxidizing juices, uh, where it normally occurs in the U.S. population in about one in 300,000 births. It occurs in one in 3,600 births in the ancestry of Oxidizing juice because the Oxidizing juice as a culture have a tendency to inbreed amongst themselves and not outbreed in the whole population. The same thing is true with the Amish in Pennsylvania. They have a very, very high incidence of what's called polydactyls, in which you have more than five digits on your toes or your fingers, etc., cetera, a sixth or a seventh digit, because they have a tendency to breed within their population. This is an example of what the founder's principle looks like. Uh, uh, an outcast from the population or an individual okay, that has a different phenotype okay, or has the rare phenotype begins to form a new population in which the increase of that is significant. And so you can change the evolutionary pattern of that particular disease by what's called the founder. And the last is the recessive condition of sickle cell anemia. Um, sickle cell uh, occurs due to an abnormal structure in one of the globin proteins, the globin proteins, that form hemoglobin. Uh, there's two globin proteins, so, alphas and betas, there's two mm -hmm. alphas and two betas, they form together to form normal hemoglobin. The defective beta falls in a different pattern. The folding of the beta protein the in the blood space. cells end up being this particular shape, looks what? a little bit like a sickle. At the same time, it's like a Soviet sickle. Soviet sickle, sickle. But is it, did you so have it more time? So when it moves through small capillaries, with the little yeah, pinch at the end, etc., and the other tendency class? to crisscross track huh? and block. Oh, the other class is the physical, no, the math one. It is one of the know. clearest examples that we have oh, in this yeah. yeah. of uh, the change in a gene sequence or a single nucleus leading to a dysfunctional protein <coughs> that leads to a significant genetic oh. disease. You don't have to go it. And it may be curable to some extent. When we get to the lecture, we'll look at that. I'm going to stop with this book and ask them. One of the things I told you that was part of the responsibility of the grade to the board is there going to be quizzes throughout the semester. There was a quiz on Blackboard that was open right now. You can go to play quiz number four. Oh, text of this. Yeah. Hey, can you text him? I have to text this. Yeah. You have from now, I believe, until 12 30. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you something. Instead of giving you credit for coming today, like I've done for a couple of extra credits that we'll get at the end of the semester, I'll have them in the end of the semester. Instead of giving you extra credit today, I'm going to give you a quiz. Those who are not here don't get those points. That's a lot of points. Five questions with ten points. It's all one person telling you. Is this extra credit? What you're going to do is what we're doing. We don't have it. Just do it. There's five questions for today. Take my question. 
are good examples of the kinds of questions that we'll see on the third test. Matter of fact, you might see something. There'll be the second test. Uh, what? We'll see. Wait, didn't you already take it? No. <laughs> <laughs> you already took it. You didn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> you totally already took it. <laughs> that was like a long time. That was supposed to be like you never faced it again. Don't lie to me. <laughs> you took this. <laughs> That's quiz three. Alright, begin. Oh. Are you in this? Oof. Is it all you separated during Neosis 1? How many of you don't have a laptop and you can do it now? I can come to my head. Are you going to go back to your room? You going to run back to your room real quick? No, my laptop's closed. Your laptop's closed? Yeah, I should be able to do it. It's good. It's good. And being reduced. So, so reduced is adding. Okay, that, that would be reduces increasing your charge. That'd be NADH plus, NAD plus, NAD plus, NAD plus. Break the mean down. Is that right? Okay, A A is no. I don't even know. Yeah, any it has to be NAD plus. Oof. Reverse glycolysis would be Gluconeogenesis. It's not. It's not. Wait. So what is it? It's not even on the. Watch this. This is how you search. Oh no. Watch this. Calvin cycle. How'd you get that? Carbon dioxide is three phosphorus plus two. Oh, damn. Way too far ahead. <laughs> yeah, fixation of um, to form. Awesome. Let's go. Alright, that's two confirmed. Two down in the bag. You doing it, <laughs> please? Okay. Um, what causes the degradation of and the mitosis? She coughs. She coughs. She Just do the quiz. <laughs> Sister chromatids. That's what I was thinking, but then I feel like it's a like it's, yeah, it seems too like. No, that has to be it. It is. Yeah. Right. Those are the fun Second messenger is camp. Huh? Second messenger is cyclical AMP. Cyclical AMP. Sure. Yeah. I, I I thought that, then I also heard them behind us. <laughs> Did you get the second question? Degradation of the. Yeah. 
to charge it. Like raw dates. Because I think I wrote a list of quiz, which is really busy. Interface promoting APC, interface promoting complex. We have time, we have time. Okay, I always get peer pressure to so finish ready when everybody finishes. Don't follow the crowd, bro. <laughs> Okay, now I'm getting, okay, sister chromatids do separate in my meiosis, I'm pretty sure. Can you look that one up? Answers. Okay, so what we have so far is for number one, NAD plus. For number three, Calvin cycle. For number four, cyclic AMP. And for number five, sister chromatids. Do you have number two? Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. What is it? Okay, hopefully she sees it first. <laughs> but like, she said she'll get number two when she has it. She'll text us. Uh, uh, I'm getting mixed results, man. Mixed results? <laughs> that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> Re that's not. Is it haploid? The process results in four daughter cells Maturation. that are haploid. The results in a haploid. Making a degradation in a negative feedback loop. Sexually dividing cells. I think it's definitely this destruction of the process initiated by the activity. Wait, hold on. So your friend is going to be the sacrifice? Hopefully. Yeah. She's just she's someone in my lab. Yeah. She'd do it for the vine. Yeah. I'm waiting for the professor to just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it, bro. This is just chromatids or haplocells. Haplocells is the result. Okay, I think I got its destruction by a process initiated. Okay, so you got that too? Okay. Yeah. She didn't tell me. Now, okay. I just gave her all the answers for nothing. <laughs> uh, no, yeah. She said she confirmed it too. So, okay, that, 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 that. No, kid. Okay, it's not, it's not triad, it's, tri it's not haploid cells. It's not? Because that's what results. That's what that's saying? It says the process results in four daughter cells that are haploid. Okay. Oh, uh, was it sister chromatids? Okay, thanks. She did sacrifice it. <laughs> did it? Yeah, it was homologue. So what about these others? That's good, it's all good. That's it's Calvin good. cycle, destruction, and NAD plus. Let's do it. I'll send it first. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's no problem, okay. but if you want to, 5 out of 5, right? Why did you say that? So, scroll down. And if it's okay. Then look. There you go. 5 out of 5, right? Yeah. Cool. yeah. There you go, biology, come back. 
Last says as mine. Five out of five, let's go. Yeah, Wait, Elvis. Huh? Elvis. Yo. Uh, hey. He has ten minutes. Oh god, I can't smell it from the street. <laughs> he's too far. Huh? He's too far. He's always like a low moment where it's really bad. I got my rain jacket. It just took it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I can't take it anymore. Well, actually, it was a TA. <laughs> Why? Really? <laughs> they're like, is this someone's brain? You gave until 12.30. Got a new one, but like, oh, thanks. That's I know. My mom's gonna be like, wow. Is it like based on, is it like those IP pictures based on like your business? This is the new one. No. Yeah, no. It's not.